Hey folks, Chuck Black here. We are doing 52 weeks of Python. We are in week number 40, and we are continuing to talk about Flask. And in this lesson, we're going to be talking about extending the application that we built last time, which involved a host monitor, host display, and a host server, and expanding it to be more like Quokka. And if you don't know what Quokka does, it does host monitoring, but it also does device monitoring as well as service monitoring and so we have created applications that do those two things and displays that display them and we've augmented our Flask service so that it includes data for devices and services as well and so it's all pretty simple as you can see there's output for it right here here's my services that are running the ones that are in cyan are actually not meeting response time agreements service level agreements and so they're highlighted in that way the ones that are red are not responding at all over here in host these are the discovered hosts and the ones that are red are not responding right now and of course uh, as with last week when they are the lighter version of green then i just got new data for them and so in that situation last heard has changed and then we also have the GUI for the devices and then with the devices I go out and I get the facts for them using Napalm and so that includes from sockets getting IP address but from Napalm and get facts I get the model number and the OS version number I decide whether it's available and what the response time is myself and so this is uh, what I have done I've expanded it to do this and we walk through the code and we talk in general about the fact that you could actually replace these display things with an actual GUI that runs in a browser with JavaScript or whatever uh, user interface framework you might want to use because of the way that we built this. So yeah, it's a pretty cool, it's starting to be a pretty cool thing and I'm kind of excited about it. I'm anticipating building in database functionality and maybe some other stuff as well as we go through the last 12 or so weeks of this class. So anyway, that's what we'll be talking about. I hope it sounds interesting. Let's get started. Okay, so we're continuing our discussion of Flask. And by popular demand, I'm going to be augmenting this thing that was originally the host server. I can see I need to update that on my slide. It was originally host server, and it had a host table, and it had a little application host display that printed stuff out like this and it had a little application called host monitor which would go and it would discover hosts and then it would ping them. and then it would ping them and update the host table in the database and it did all of this with rest api calls or at least keeping track of everything that it with rest api calls the reason for that is so that this monitor can be independent from the display and that's something that's important. One thing I do want to mention, and you need to listen to this so you're aware of it, what this allows is that I can get rid of my little display here and replace it with a real display like a nice GUI inside a browser. And I don't have to change my monitor and I don't have to change my host server. I'm able to do that because I built this with REST calls so that the uh, the software that actually does the display can be a simple terminal program like this one that looks nice, but it does have limitations, or it could be a nice user interface like we have with Quokka. So that's what we had, and you guys requested as the next thing for me to expand it. So what I've done is I have built in a device monitor, or I've created a device monitor and a device display. So these two applications are similar to host, monitor and host display, there's a devices table in the server and everything runs basically the same except it's doing device stuff rather than doing host stuff. Now I also added a service monitor and a service display. If you're familiar with Quokka, you know that that is something like this where uh, we basically can define different types of services, DNS, HTTPS. Uh, you can see I added ICMP. Uh, you can also do NTP. Those are the ones that I have implemented. And if you do want to see the device display, it's pretty short and sweet. It uh, goes out to the devices, connects to them, finds out if they're available or not, prints the response time. Uh, it actually does a better job than Quokka at uh, 
recording the response time there. I probably should change clock it to do it like this. And the last herd, of course. So now my application, just so you know, if we're to look at it, this is my host table display, which is the same as it was before. This is my device display, which has IP address model. It does have this version. So if something changes, then you could become aware of it. And then lastly, it has this service output. And it's showing here uh, what you might be interested in knowing what this cyan color means. What I did was I implemented the thing that I've done for uh, Quokka with service level agreement stuff. I'm using that value to compare the response time to that value. And I print this as cyan if uh, it doesn't meet the response time. So you see that one that I was pointing at, talak.com, used to be cyan, but now it's under uh, the amount, the, the SLA value that I had set. And David Bombles always seems to be around here, so it at least stays like this. If you're wondering what this uh, particular ICMP is, it's not that it's failing, it's my laptop. Uh, I'm going to open up it's a different laptop, not the one that I'm working on. It's one that I installed Ubuntu on. That's why I call it Ubuntu Quokka. I'm running Quokka on it, and it's just sitting uh, in my office here doing nothing most of the time. And so uh, it basically, I have uh, opened it. It was closed so that it wasn't responding. So I think the next time, yeah, there you can see that it has responded. The response time tends to be around one second, which I think in this case is 0 0.02 slower uh, than it should be. Uh, and then you see my ICMP, so I'm pinging my gateway, which I'm not sure if that's of any value, but my home router uh, is responding to that. Anyway, that's what that is. Let's look over here. This is my uh, server. It's now called host device service. Um, oh, that's, the, that's not what it's called. That's the directory that it is in what it is actually called. I've actually forgotten what it's called. I'm calling it a Quokka server. So it actually is the Quokka service. You'll see in the code here, I've added devices and services. And this was the code that handled REST calls for hosts. And I've added to handle calls for devices, as you can see here, and to, for calls for services. But again, I'm just storing the data locally would want to do this in the database. That's why I say don't do this. Uh, but what I've done is I've made it only a single process uh, on my system is going out and writing data. So it seems to be relatively safe. That is my server that's running right there. I do have my monitors running. And so up here, I have my service monitor that's running and it's updating with the service status as it goes out and gets that information. Uh, and this is my host. This is my host discovery and update. So you can see it's doing that. And this is my device discovery. As you saw, I only have a couple of devices. So uh, that's what that is. So that is an overview of what this is. Let's take a look at the code and see what it actually does. Actually, before we go and look at the code, I want to go over a couple things. Number one, you'll notice that the text is smaller. You're not imagining things. I did make it a little bit smaller so that I can fit things like all of these nice uh, user interface things onto the same screen without them overlapping. So that is true. The second thing that I wanted to review for all of us is to go over how I'm actually running this. Now, remember, these are there's the Flask application, and then there are monitors that are running, little applications that I run from terminal windows. And then these displays are little applications that I run from terminal windows as well. So the actual startup is uh, involves a number of things, and we'll be looking at them one at a time. I suspect one would write a script if they wanted to use something like this to monitor their network. Uh, and that would be the advisable way to do it. But while we're doing debugging, it kind of makes sense to do it uh, one at a time so we can see what's going on. So the first thing that I'll start is the actual Flask server that's running this stuff. Now, remember, the way that we did that was we had to ex export Flask app. This Flask app thing needs to be set uh, in order for Flask, when we do a Flask run, in order for it to know 
what to run. So the thing that it's running is Quokka server dot pi. If I go and look down here, that's the name of my Flask application. So I need to make sure that I'm running, I'm telling Flask what it is that it's running. So we'll go ahead and start that. And as you recall, it just runs in the background and waits for stuff to happen. It really is just our central repository for doing stuff. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to start all of the user interfaces and they will get going and you'll see at the beginning they're updating but there's no data. What you don't know is that I've actually recorded this a number of times and found little bugs in my code when doing exactly this because I don't normally do this and so I happily found bugs and fixed them. Hopefully they're all fixed now. If not, you probably won't know it because I'll delete this recording, but there you go. So I'm going to try starting up host because that's interesting from a, a scappy doing an ARP ping to go find all the devices. And now if we look over here, when it prints, it should be telling us that some of the devices have been discovered. And there they are showing up um, that it has found some of the devices and uh, yeah, and it's updating the last herd, etc. So we now have house host going. By the way, let's look here. Remember, we started our Quokka Flask service and it sat around initially doing nothing. And suddenly when I started hosts, it started to go and do a bunch of stuff. Th this part right here was when I was starting the user interfaces. And then this, when I started to discover host, that's what it did. So uh, we've started host. Let's look at devices. That's one of the things that I had to fix some bugs on. This is devices, I think. So I'm going to start my device monitor. This is my device user interface. No, that's my service user interface. Let me get the device user interface, which is right here. So when I start this, we should see this get changed and uh, it's going to update it. You can see that I've added both of these and I'm displaying them. They're both false because remember it goes out and it does SSH and tries to connect to the device and it does a get fax from the device so that it can print out version and model and other stuff. And I calculate myself the response time. So it looks like it got one. Sure enough, it updated it. And there's my CSR 1000 V that tells me the exact model number. Uh, I have to go and use a regular expression to get out this version, or maybe I do it for the Nexus device. I can't remember. One of these comes in exactly as you'd expect it. I think it's the Nexus one. And then this one up here, I have to use a regular expression to parse it if you're interested in looking at that stuff. So you can see, um, let's see. Yep, yeah, that's updated. So now my devices are updating. So that's good. Now all I have left are the services. You can see I have no services and I think my service monitor is right here. So let's go ahead and start this. In one of my attempts, <laughs> it, it barfed when uh, I was doing this here incorrectly. So it seems to be doing it correctly, going out and getting this information. As I said before, I've added ICMP as a new type of service probe that can be done. And just so you know, and as a heads up, if you're interested in object-oriented stuff, I implemented the service monitor in an object-oriented manner. So uh, we'll look at that code in just a minute. But uh, I think that's what I was pretty much going to show you. These are the user interfaces for uh, all of the different uh, things that I'm monitoring. My hosts, my services down here, and up here are my two little devices, which are actually Cisco Sandbox devices in the cloud. So now let's look at the code. Okay, let's get started looking at the code. Remember the things that changed is I added a device monitor, device display, service monitor, service display, which mirror pretty much the host monitor and host display that already existed. We're gonna start by looking at this Flask server, which I've named Quokka server. So let's take a look at that code. So Quokka server, Two things that have changed in it. I have global devices and global services. Remember, we're not going to use this in a real product, but because I only have one writer to the devices and one writer to the services, it's probably okay right now. Um, so, uh, but we are using those and those have been added. Now, if you recall from before, we had this uh, hosts endpoint 
and we handle get, post, put, and delete. And we're going to do exactly the same thing for our devices endpoint. So this is exactly the same. The only difference is I'm dealing with the device's data structure rather than the host data structure. And the same is true for services. So here I have services. I'm using global services to return. And remember, uh, if they ask for a get, then we return the entire data structure. If they do a post, which we don't use, it replaces the existing global services with whatever the user passed in. If they do a put, then we get the name from, uh, from the uh, parameter that was passed in, the query parameter. That's how we do that. It needs to be passed in. We get the JSON, which is going to be the data associated with that particular service in this situation because we're in services. And then we are going to set global services at that name. Now, if the name uh, exists, then we will be replacing it with the new data. If it doesn't exist, remember this is a dictionary. So what if it, it doesn't exist, we're going to be setting uh, a new item in that dictionary with the key of name and the value equal to service, which is what we got in. Delete, as I mentioned, I haven't really ever even tested it, but uh, allegedly we get the name and then we delete that item from the dictionary. So that is the Quokka server in a nutshell. Not really a lot changed except that we handle slash devices and slash services and we do the exact same thing that we do with hosts. So let's look at the interesting stuff that has changed. Now the two main things that have changed are going to be device monitor and service monitor. The display is fairly straightforward. So let's dive into device monitor and see what it does. So we're looking here at device monitor. I'm going to go down to the bottom so we can see what the outer loop basically does. And if you recall from our host monitor, this is fundamentally the same. I'm going to set my last discovery and then I'm going to do discovery if it's time to do it. Otherwise, I'm going to get my devices from the server and I'm going to go through and uh, for every single device, I'm going to, instead of just pinging it, I'm going to do a get device back. So that gives you an indication. Oh, I, I'll bet you he's using Napalm. And indeed, I am using Napalm to get that information. And then update device is just to go out to our Quokka server and update the device with the appropriate device information so that our uh, display can grab that information appropriately. So let's take a look first at discovery and see what happens. So here I am at discovery and I have it in quotes here. I have it in air quotes in my mind because I'm not really discovering these devices, but rather I'm reading them from a configuration file. This configuration file is devices.yaml if we look at it. And if you're familiar with what I've done in Quokka, you'll see, okay, well, that's a YAML file just like in Quokka. And in fact, it is identical, except it has a few, it has fewer devices in it. But this is basically what it's specifying, the name, the, I, the operating system, the transport that I'm using. You'll see I'm using Napalm in both of these cases. I'm going to need uh, the host name, the password, the username, uh, the SSH port. And uh, yeah, so that's the information that I'm going to need for that. I don't need some of this other stuff for right now. So it's going to go out and read those and it's going to read them in. And this will be this devices uh, is now going to end up being a list which has the device information from that YAML file in it. So what I'm going to do also is I'm going to go out and get what exists out there already because if I already have discovered this device, I don't want to overwrite important information like availability and response time. So what I'm going to do first is I'm going to go and say, oh, can I get the IP address from this device? And if I can, I'm going to set the device IP address to the appropriate thing. This is what I do in Quokka. I'm just using a socket call get host by name and passing this in and I will end up getting the IP address. If it fails, I'm just going to set the IP address to nothing because I don't know what that is. And then I continue and I say, if the device is already exists, then I really don't want to do much of anything except update the IP address if I have one. And then I'm going to set uh, this 
device equal to the existing devices. So the existing devices has a bunch of information in it already, uh, all the stuff about facts and availability, etc. All I'm doing here, remember, is discovery. So I'm just discovering the existence. So I'm just going to update it with that IP address. Otherwise, if it's brand new, I'm going to go through and create it and give it these default values. And then the last thing that I do is update device. I'm just going to go down into this at the end of my, and this is at the end of discovery, remember. This is where we just do a put and we pass in the actual device and we send it in the form of this dictionary. Sorry, the parameters say the name and this and the actual dictionary that we pass in is that right there. Yeah, sorry about that. The params, the way that you do a put is the way that you, speci is you specify params in a dictionary and you give the keyword and then the value and that's what that is. All right, so that is update device and that is discovery. Let's go back down and look at the hard work. The hard work is this right here, get device facts. So I'm gonna go into get device facts. Now, here I'm checking for the operating system because I need to get the appropriate Napalm network driver. I'm not gonna go through all of this Napalm stuff because I have that lesson on Napalm that we've already done, but basically I'm gonna go through, get the driver from the driver, I'm gonna get my Napalm device. So that's gonna give me my Napalm device. I'm gonna do an open on that device. Then I'm gonna do this time start so that I can keep track of how long it takes. I'm gonna call Napalm Get Facts. Again, if you're interested in Napalm, go look at the Napalm lesson where I talk about all of this stuff. And then we calculate the response time. And from those facts, I'm gonna get certain information. The stuff that's easy would be something like the model. Getting the version is a little bit more difficult because certain times the version is just the version number and sometimes the version is a very long string with a bunch of stuff and you can see, I'm only interested in this version snippet uh, that is right there. So let's look at get version. I'm gonna go down into that. Now, uh, if it is an iOS XE type of device, so this is special, I have to do something for it. I have to do a regular expression search and I'm searching for version and I'm finding this. Again, if you're interested in regular expressions, I have a lesson on regular expressions, so uh, find that out. So we're looking for um, that information and if I find it, then I am going to, and I'm looking in that, uh, the facts that I got the OS version from the facts. It's occurring to me now I could have just passed in the version that would have been more straightforward, I think. I uh, know because I want to update this, I, I want to update uh, the facts so that I can use this facts when I come back. That's right. So basically, um, what I'm doing is I'm finding it. If I if I find it, then I set, um, I'm going to return the actual version uh, value. Otherwise, I'm going to just return the actual one that I got back from my get facts. Okay, I went over that kind of quick and I don't know. think that I described it too well, but the, basically if there's a match and I found it, then I'm going to return group one, which is going to be this thing right here. This is my group one and that will be the version number. Otherwise, I'm just returning whatever was passed to me in the facts. And so when I am in my uh, update device or in my get device facts, uh, you can see that I will be getting the version and setting device subversion to whatever that value is. If it's an iOS XE device, then I will have parsed it using the regular expression. Otherwise, I'll just use the facts as it is. And let's see, I set the response time, I set the last herd, etc. And that is how device monitor actually works. And as you can see here, it's got, I, I have discovered the IP address. I have gotten the model back from the, um, from my uh, get fax call. I've got the version from my get fax call and I calculated availability and the response time and I set the last herd value. So there you go, that's the device monitor. Really, this is uh, fairly complicated, but it's still less than 150 lines of code and it's all pretty straightforward, I think. 
Alrighty then, let's look at the service monitor. Now I mentioned the service monitor had some interesting object-oriented stuff. You can probably get a hint of that from here. This is some stuff that I wrote to implement the service monitor piece that's gonna go out and communicate with whatever the service is. But let's start with the way that we started before, which is looking at the outer loop, which is in this main function. So the discovery stuff, is the same as before. If we need to do discovery, we will, and we'll look at that in a minute. Then we get the services from the from the Quokka server, and then we iterate through them one at a time. Remember, it's a dictionary, so we're doing services.values. We iterate through them, and we get the service status, and that will be either um, that it's available or unavailable. If something went wrong in my attempt to communicate with the service, I don't do anything. So I'm only going to do something if I was able to get the service status. And that service status, the way it's implemented, might be available, it might be unavailable, but it will return true either way. The only way it comes down here and wouldn't update the service is if it ran into an internal error in some way. So let's look at discovery and see what it does. Discovery is again in quotes. Basically, I'm reading, this time I'm reading the YAML, the services.yaml file services.yaml looks like this. Once again, it looks similar to what is in Quokka if you've been there before. And in fact, I have a lot of the same services, but you'll see I did add some. I added an ICMP service. Um, yeah, and did I add anything else? I, I don't think that I did. A couple of ICMP services uh, that we, we will be able to ping, and I had to implement that. So that is what we are reading. So once we have read the services, if the service is already in the existing service, I don't have anything that I need to do. Remember, with devices, I learned the IP address, or I attempted to learn the IP address. In this situation, I have nothing new to add, so I don't have to do anything. But uh, I'm going to go through here, and I am going to, if the service name is not in existing services, I'm going to have to add it. So this is how I add it. I come through here, and I'm going to say, if data is not in service, then I set data equal to this. I probably could, well, I guess that's okay right there. So I set it to nothing. If they if they gave me data, if there's data in the services.yaml, then you'll see for some of these, there is no data. And for some of them, there is data. So it's an optional item. And so if there's no data, then I need to set that to a blank string. And then I set availability to false response time to zero at zero last third, et cetera. And then I'm going to update the service. That's what I do in discovery. And so I'm going to do that for every one of the services. And update service is not really anything more interesting, except the URL is different, but everything else is the same. I'm passing in the query parameter of name and passing in the actual service. So I'm passing in these one at a time. Update service passes in one service. Now here's the interesting thing. This is get service status. This is where the object-oriented magic happens right here. Basically, depending on the service type that has been requested, if it's HTTP or HTTPS, then what I'm going to do is I'm going to create an object called HTTP monitor. If it's DNS, I'm going to create an object called DNS monitor. If it's NTP, I'm going to create NTP monitor. If it's ICMP, I'm going to create ICMP monitor. What are those things? Well, let's go look at them. I'm going to go do my control B. That'll take me to my service monitor file. Do you see it there? I'm not sure I like how I named that. I, I mean, the camel case is fine, but it's the same name as the other thing. This is really service status getter or something like that. That's a bad name for it also, but it's more... I should have chosen something different, but hopefully you don't get too confused by it and you can distinguish between service underscore monitor, which is the thing like host monitor and device monitor, and this thing right here, which is actually the thing that does the monitoring piece. Now I've created a base class called service monitor, and in it I have name, target, and data. Those are the three things that are needed if I'm going to go get... Um, I'm going to attempt to access the service. Now, one thing that's missing here is the type of service. That's because we don't need that. Because what's going to happen is you're not going to actually create a service monitor. You're going to create 
an HDTV monitor or a DNS monitor or an NTP monitor or an ICMP monitor. And what are these things? They don't do anything except they implement get status. You can see up here, we're gonna raise an exception if somebody tries to uh, call get status on the service monitor object because it's not implemented. But if they're calling it on an HTTP monitor, then get status will come in here. And I'm just gonna use the um, request library to attempt to go to that URL. And I'm gonna record both the uh, availability, which is that, and the response time, which is that. If it fails, we return false and a zero. What does DNS monitor do? Well, the DNS code is all isolated within here. I'm using this DNS library that if you remember from Quokka, maybe you don't if you haven't seen it, but I'm using a DNS library in order to go and just do a DNS request. And so uh, these are potential errors that I can get when I attempt to do my DNS query. So non-existent domain name, DNS request timed out, exception occurred, etc. If I uh, am successful with this response, with getting this response from my resolver, then I will come here and I'll check is the response not none, is response.response .response not none, and is response.answer greater than zero. That means it worked. So if that's true, then I return true for availability and my actual um, elapsed time, the response time, Other word, otherwise I return false and a zero. Now for NTP, as you might expect, I'm using an NTP library to make my request and I go ahead and do that same type idea here. And for ICMP monitor, I'm just doing a ping. So I'm gonna use sub process to do a ping in the same way that I do actually for my host um, monitor. So I'm gonna do this ping and if it's successful, which it will be if it returns here, then everything's okay. If it fails, in other words, if the device is not available, then it's going to come out here and say service ping failed and return false. I think if we look at these services here, uh, I'm gonna close my laptop and supposedly within, I don't know, 15 or 20 seconds, let's see, where is, this is my, that's my hosts. This is my device. Naturally, I went to everyone. So it's getting my service status right here. I'm thinking that for my ICMP, so my ping failed to my Quokka service and when this updates, this should turn red. Let's keep our fingers crossed. Boom, okay, so it turned red. So that is the code and how it works and what it does. That's for service monitoring. As I mentioned, we, I could spend time going through the uh, display of devices, device display, but as you will see from this, I pretty much go through every device and I do red, green, or light green, and I print things out. I had to try to squeeze things in. So I'm printing out host name, IP address, model, availability, response time, all the things that you see right there. And what about for service display? What does that look like? Well, it's again, it's pretty much the same, except I'm printing out the name, the type, the target, data, availability, response time. Oh, I did add something in here. If the response time is greater than the SLA response time, so I'm looking at that response time and seeing if it meets the criteria. Now I just had a peek at this and it and four of them were this cyan color the last time that I looked. Uh, I'm not sure if we'll get this to change. You can see response times for TLAC, the, the HTTP ones for BBC News is pretty quick, 0.17. For uh, TLAC, it's half a second. I think I have that set at half a second for David Bomble's website. I truncated that by the way. It's actually 1.62, so that's quite a bit longer. For Google, it's 0 0.15, so Google is always quite fast. My gateway right here, okay, well there is a change. TLAC is better than 0.5, so you see that I'm doing the cyan correctly. This is my gateway, 
and I'm pinging it and <laughs> the response time is always 1.01 or 1.02 it seems that's what it always is and of course down here is my poor laptop that I closed and now I can no longer ping it so that is the Quokka-esque version of using Flask. And again, remember, I'm doing this in a different way than with Quokka. If you remember from Quokka, or if you haven't done it and you choose to go do the Quokka walkthrough uh, where I describe it, I do all of my monitoring within the Quokka server itself. And the reason is I launch threads that do it. Right now, I'm not sure if I like this better. This is kind of, uh, you know, it's a little bit simpler and easier to implement. And my server is nice and short and qu and clean, and it doesn't have a bunch of extra stuff. I'm not sure which I like uh, better. So I, as I go through doing more and more of this stuff, then we'll see more. So yeah, that's, that's my Quokka server, and that is Quokka implemented as an extension of our little host's application. Just FYI, I'm thinking that in the future what will end up happening is these three things will end up just having a little picture here with an SQL database. And I'll probably use SQLite in order to keep it as simple as possible. And you'll see how easy it is to add database stuff to your simple mini Quokka server and to add it to your skill set in being a software developer. You can also almost be a full stack. Oh yeah, one other thing I want to mention. This is really important. I can't remember if I ended up deleting the thing where I mentioned this before, so my apologies if I'm saying this again. What if I don't like these displays? Could I build a real user interface on top of this Quokka and have it display like in the Quokka user interface? in tables there. And the answer to that is absolutely. This is built in that way. All the all the GUIs would be doing is they would be coming down and they would be making, let's take a look, what would they be doing if this was a real uh, GUI? I'm looking at the Quokka server here. They would be coming down, since it's just showing stuff, they would be doing git of all the hosts and displaying it in a nice uh, browser-based table. Here they would be doing a git uh, for the devices and here they would be doing a git for the services and it occurs to me well yeah I print out a little icon in Quokka that shows whether it's available or not I don't turn the whole line red I guess I could do that as well but yeah so do you see how we build little bits and pieces so in this situation what did we use we used YAML for reading in stuff about devices and services we used object oriented stuff for doing our service monitoring. Uh, we used uh, Napalm in order to do device checking. For the host, we're using um, Scappy to discover the host. If I had the scan thing, we would be using Nmap. So all of these things that you've been learning about here in the networking, and let's see, where's the object-oriented stuff, and files, that's all coming into use right now. We're beginning to use it in a real semi-legitimate uh, application that actually does stuff. And knowing how to do this, for those of you that are trying to learn software, doing stuff like this, this is taking you very, very far down the road from where you were before. I hope I, you are able to understand it and that you find it useful and that you're aware of how much good stuff you're learning from a software perspective. Okay, folks, let's review what we talked about. Remember, we were taking this uh, Flask application that we had created that did hosts. Basically, there was a little data in the Flask application that had host information in it. There's a REST API that allowed us to get, put, post, and delete from that uh, data in the Flask application, called, uh, which I've called now Quokka Server. I did host display and host monitor. The monitor is the thing that discovered and monitored devices. Display is the thing that displayed it, like you can see right here. And what I did was I augmented this by adding device discovery and monitoring and also service discovery and monitoring. Now, discovery is in quotes because we read it from a file, but the monitoring 
is totally legit and we have display functionality as well and you can see that here that we are displaying this data for services and up here we're displaying it for data we looked at the code remember the code we looked at the quokka server and we added stuff for devices as you can see there and services as you can see there the main code that we looked at was the device monitor in the device monitor we got device facts and added them uh, to the data in the Flask uh, service that was running that's called Quokka Server now. And we looked at Service Monitor, which was a little bit interesting because what it did was it utilized object-oriented capabilities to create objects that would go and get us the status appropriately. So we create this thing that we called Monitor, but it could be either an HTTP Monitor DNS monitor, NTP monitor, or ICMP monitor. It didn't matter, I just called get status on it. And the code in those subclasses knows how to do the retrieval of availability and response time. And then we store it, and that's what you end up seeing here under availability and response time. So we looked a little bit at the display code. There wasn't a ton of extra stuff there. We did mention that we read in from the YAML files that's pretty much the same as what we do in Quokka. So yeah, that's kind of what we did in this lesson. Hopefully it made sense to you. Hopefully you know a little bit more about how you can use Flask with your Python application, how you can build something that really, frankly, is kind of significant and cool, even with a very small amount of code. So uh, as always, if you have questions, then send them to me. I'll be happy to answer them for you. Until then, thanks for listening.